This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to re-watching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Katie White, and joining me as always is my good friend and co-host, Chad Hopkins. Hello again. So soon, Chad. Yeah, very, very soon. We decided the way things are lining up uh, with the next couple of weeks, why not just go ahead and do an extra episode? There have been a couple of bye weeks we've had in the past, so why not? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we had the time, and uh, Chad is traveling soon, so we thought we would um, just do a little bonus. Yeah, get ahead or of things. early. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Today's episode of discussion is Prince Family Paper. It aired on January 22nd, 2009, was directed by Asad Kalata, written by BJ Novak. Michael has been asked by David Wallace to scout out a small company, a small family-owned paper company in an area that they don't have clients. So Michael takes Dwight to spy and get information. Meanwhile, everyone else back at the office is having an incredibly important debate. Is actress Hilary Swank hot or not? (laughs) Yeah, that's sort of the episode, right? Yeah, not a whole lot of extra (laughs) machine parts moving around in this one. Michael and Dwight head over to Prince Family Paper, and as the name implies, it's an adorable little mom-and-pop shop. Grandpa, son, there is a granddaughter doing homework in the corner. It's just very wholesome, and uh, Michael poses as a potential client, and Dwight comes in pretending that he is uh, looking for a job. And so Mm -hmm. they're in there at the same time, kind of bouncing information back and forth. Dwight gets information like salary and and employee benefits, stuff like that, Michael gets what they offer to their clients um, and eventually even gets a client list of all of their biggest clients. So mission accomplished. David Wallace sent them out to to accomplish this and they got everything and more that he would have wanted. And of course, Michael being Michael kind of clings to this idea that this is a really good family and has a lot of trouble with the idea that he's going to sabotage them. And this time, Michael being Michael is a good thing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Because this is like the sweetest family ever. You know, he says, we started this company after I came back from Vietnam, which Michael doesn't really understand what that means. He says, oh, Vietnam, I hear it's lovely. Uh, He's talking about a war, Michael. He, (laughs) he, He fought in a war and a lot of people died. Then when they're getting ready to leave, Michael drives over the curb and then backs up and half of his bumper goes with it. And so then they come out and they help him reassemble his bumper so he doesn't have to call a tow truck. So these are just the sweetest people. They get him coffee while they're waiting on his car to be prepared. They're so sweet. And here Michael is with all the information that's just going to tear apart their business. And so he does feel bad. Uh, the, The moment when Roger just hands over the client list, unasked for, just like, Just ask any of these biggest clients that we have. I'm sure they'll be willing to give you glowing reviews. They Michael just stares. He's like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) He he can't believe how successful this was. And it's not because of any real skill that Michael has. I mean, he is a people person and he, he gets along with Roger. But these are just the nicest people and they're so trusting. And so it, it makes sense why Michael feels so bad about it. And he didn't really come to that realization until he was back at the office. He and Dwight were thrilled, and that's kind of why they pulled out of the parking lot. And uh, because he was so excited to have gotten all this information, and um, Dwight's enthusiasm never really wanes. In fact, he's the one that eventually, I mean, I don't know if persuades is the right word, but forces Michael into telling David Wallace. Um, But David Wallace is thrilled, of course. So Mm -hmm. uh, Michael feels torn because... On one hand, he's potentially ruining this family because David seems to want to just shut them down and take over their their client base. And on the other hand, he's happy because he's made David happy and he looks good doing his job. So he's just, he's torn. Yeah, Dwight, Dwight is so eager the whole time. When he first walks in, he does land an interview and the explanation he gives for leaving Dunder Mifflin is his boss. And so I was curious... Is is it just because that's what he knows is he knows Michael and he can sort of take what he knows and make it bigger or is he uh, I don't know I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say but 
what, was he just clueless to the fact that his boss was actually there? Because he's talking about his boss's insensitivity bordering on cruel. And that's Michael a lot of the time. I mean, we have Diversity Day as a direct result of Michael's actions. I think it's a bit of both. Um, we see Dwight in kind of two Michael lights. One where he is his undying servant and would go to the end of the world for Michael. And then in the other light, he is very aware that Michael is flawed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. It seems to kind of flip-flop, to be honest. So in this episode, it kind of seems like, well, yeah, he is there to help Michael and they're a team and they're, they've clearly done this before. They're in like stakeout mode. He pulls that information about Michael out of his back pocket really quickly. So yeah. it's, I mean, I think it's in the back of his head. He knows that Michael's flawed. And um, when you're applying for a job, especially a fake job, yeah, I mean, a boss is a good reason. It's just kind of a throwaway. Like, oh, my boss is crazy. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Trying to convince Michael to hand over the client list instead of destroying it or whatever Michael's planning on doing with it. Dwight chases him down. He says, it's business. It's not personal, which exactly echoes Michael's sentiment back in business school where he says, it's business. It's the most personal thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, again, d demonstrating that Michael cares about people and he doesn't want to ruin this family's livelihood. And, and, and in the end, he says, I guess this is what they call a bittersweet moment. It is bitter because I slightly destroyed a wonderful little family. Slightly destroyed, but sweet because David Wallace thought I did a good job. That's why I hate bittersweet chocolate. I don't even, what's the point of that? Why not just sweet? Who are you helping? <laughs> Michael's struggling a bit with his um, morals, I guess, in this episode. He, mm -hmm. as we've said, he feels badly about that. Dwight, of course, also, as we've said, just in summary, does not feel badly at all. Um, it is no. all business. And he even kind of tries to ration it out with Michael and say, like, look, it's, yeah, they're they're nice, but this is the job. He tries to high five Michael in the car afterwards, and Michael doesn't relent, so he just high fives himself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now at the office, Stanley and Phyllis, of all people, are the ones who spark this debate over whether or not Hillary Swank is hot, which is a, maybe a weird place for this to come from. Uh, initially, Jim tries to sort of quell the discussion to keep everyone on task. But then it's a tie when they have a vote. And so it has to continue. Kevin says, five. It's five to five. And Jim says, thank you, accounting department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was odd that it came from those two as well, from Stanley and Phyllis. And I, I had a similar note that Jim is the one to propel this. Like, yeah, it, it at first it's like, all right, yeah, she's clearly very hot. Let's move on. But when it becomes a tie, his little instinct to keep things going, to uh, to have a little fun in the office, kicks in. And it turns into a full-blown debate. People come up and give speeches on, on why she is or is not hot. Jim tries to sway people. In fact, he briefly changes Kevin's mind from not hot to hot. Um, <laughs> he says, sometimes we see famous people as kind of on another level, but we forget that they're human. So if Hillary Swank came into this office right now and said, Kevin Malone, I have to have you or something like that. Yeah, I want to make out with you right now. I want to make out with you right now. Is she hot? And Kevin gets up and switches sides and says, yep. And then he sits down and immediately stands back up. He's like, nope, nope, respect the game. It's not what I do her. It's is she hot? <laughs> <laughs> I love how insistent Kevin is throughout the whole episode on respecting the game and making yeah. sure it's about whether she's hot. And that's it. But Jim has this, again, this little managerial tick. Not, he's, he's very, very good at leading people. And mm -hmm. he's led this whole game. And um, we see that in Office Olympics. We see that a bit at beach games. Mm -hmm. And he's just, he's got a knack for it. He is in charge when Michael's gone, so it's nice that he's able to exercise that rather than just sort of letting it be a, a passive uh, responsibility. Even if it's over this debate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, before we get to the funny stuff, just Angela steps in, and we, we just had a pretty big episode for Angela. Uh, everyone's so dismissive of her in this episode. She says, you know, I don't want to even, like, encourage this conversation. I don't want to grace this conversation in an audience. And Jim just says, no one cares and goes back to everybody else. <laughs> so e everybody's just pretty fed up with Angela at this point. Yeah, that's a good point. We don't hear a lot from her, but what we do hear, no one really wants a part of it. 
her her biggest thing in this episode is that she is she does eventually join the debate just so that Kevin can lose. Right. But interestingly, we don't get any conversation, any feedback, anything from either Andy or Dwight towards Angela in this episode either. So everyone's just keeping their distance. Moving into funny stuff, when David is first proposing the idea of scouting out Prince paper to Michael, uh, he says he will fax over the information. And Michael says, fax it. Might as well send it over on a dinosaur. <laughs> David just says, this is important, Michael. Michael says, oh, well, then email it. And I looked it up. <laughs> Faxing does predate email, but email has still been around since the 1960s. So both are pretty old technologies at this point. And I know everybody relies on email especially, but it's kind of a dinosaur communication system as it is. Yeah. I mentioned that Michael and Dwight are in investigation mode, basically. They go, um, they just really commit to their parts. They're sitting in the car outside of Prince Family Paper eating peanuts or something like they're cops on a stakeout um, investigating this this company. And is the store growing? Is it not growing? No. Well, the sign is centered over the store, so the business is not growing. Well, no one's coming in and out and it's lunchtime. So that's another sign that business is not growing. And Michael points out, well, there are clouds. It's going to rain. Bad for business. Dwight says, oh, well, it might rain if they were autoculus clouds and not cirrostratus. And it's just, <laughs> he's going way too deep. It's like, it doesn't matter what type of cloud they are it's yeah. not <laughs> not about I, I think michael is just trying to be part of the investigation and yeah. dwight had made a couple of i mean those are pretty good observations about them not growing but then michael just says oh yeah clouds i'm looking <laughs> at the clouds and he doesn't know anything about the clouds like dwight ends up knowing michael has a talking head he says in nature there is something called a food chain it's where the shark eats a little shark and the little shark eats a literal, littler shark, and so on and so on, until you get down to the single cell shark. I didn't know those existed, but apparently they're single cell sharks. He says, so now replace sharks with paper companies, and that is all you need to know about business. Uh... I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Little fun fact, the um, grandfather, Roger, I think his name is, at uh, mm -hmm. Prince Family Paper, has a world's best dad mug, just like the one that Michael has, but it's world's best boss so a fun little cameo for that mug and also kind of a tie into like he want he's the dad sort of that michael wants to be that may be a stretch but mm -hmm. I, and I, I, <laughs> I think junior uh the one that dwight interviews with has a world's best son mug as well mm, yeah i love that the granddaughter is struggling with math and michael <laughs> comes over and tries to help her and gives her just completely bad tips on solving this like middle school math problem it, it's he doesn't know what an exponent is. He says, I don't know why there's this little two, but X means times. It's definitely not a variable. X means times. So two times four, what's two double four? Eight. There you go. And so she, she starts to write it down. And then the grandmother comes over and says, no, don't put that down, honey. Don't put that down. <laughs> In my notes, I put Michael tries math at, Pr at Prince Family Paper. <laughs> yeah, he tries. <laughs> There's a little stakeout debate in the car between Michael and Dwight. They're on their way to the company and um, they're discussing kind of their game plan. They're going to go in. They're going to get the information. And Dwight says, we wanna, we're going to meet the Denny's. Michael says, no, I want to go to IHOP. Dwight feels very strongly against IHOP. I never liked IHOP. It's Denny's. And <laughs> Dwight says, are you a socialist? <laughs> you know what? I don't want to get in, into this debate again. I enjoy IHOP. Dwight says, fine, I'll have a cup of coffee. Michael says, you will have pancakes and you'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean burgers, because... Burger, I hob. I hob, yeah. I hob, rather. I, I'm not going to get into that for That's the stupidest thing in the podcast. world. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point out how absurd it is when Michael and Dwight lick their lips at each other <laughs> in the car as a, a sign of, let's get out of here. Uh, but there's just like a, a solid five seconds where they're licking their lips at each other in the car. <laughs> And then back at the office, when Michael is struggling over giving this information to David, uh, Dwight says, well, Michael first says, my heart tells me no. Dwight says, your heart is a wonderful thing, Michael, but it has made some terrible decisions. Mm -hmm. Michael says, that's true. And yeah, we can agree. He's made some terrible decisions with his heart. Possibly the last little one for me. Um, Pam is so frustrated that um, Kevin is just adamantly against Hillary Swank being hot and she says are we really going to let the Kevins of the world decide who's hot we don't even give him full internet access 
<laughs> so that's really telling about Kevin's character. And he just says, wait, what? What? <laughs> We, we come in the middle of a conversation and Dwight is saying, it was a terrible war. Far too many died. Far too many died. And we start to think, okay, Michael actually asked about Vietnam. You know, <laughs> he, he's trying to get some information about this family. He said, Vietnam, what does that mean? But then Dwight finishes, but if Frodo hadn't destroyed the ring, goodness itself might have died. So Dwight is making this weird parallel between Lord of the Rings and destroying evil with Putting this paper company out of business, it, it doesn't quite equal out, I don't think, but yeah. it's Dwight for you. And we did have the cold open where Jim bought the 500 foot long spool of red wire for $20. He says, what a deal. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> what a deal. And he, of course, decided to use it as a prank against Dwight, connected it to his computer, led it all the way up a telephone pole outside. He says, oh, he'll be fine. I made it up there. <laughs> Such a genius way and a simple way to do Dwight. Yeah, and to get him out of his hair for a little bit, too. Yeah. <laughs> Deleted scenes, what do you got? This is a great quote that I think I've heard somewhere else as well, and I don't remember where, but Michael is discussing um, how business is a doggy dog world and um, <laughs> how, how he is a shark who eats doggy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> doggy dogs. Doggy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> And he says he's going to pull it down underwater and drown it. I, I don't think sharks are in the drowning business. They're in the no. ripping things apart with their hundreds of teeth business. Which works just fine. So I don't know why you had to change that. <laughs> <laughs> we see how Dwight actually lands the interview at Prince Paper, which is interesting because, you know, when he first walks in, he says, oh, we're not hiring new people because it's a family business. But Dwight, in this deleted scene, he says, if I call up my biggest under Mifflin client right now, and convinced him to come over to Prince Paper. Then would you give me an interview? And nobody really says anything, but Dwight does it anyways. And so he calls, oh, hey, Mr. Shaughnessy, I am preparing to work at Prince Paper. I will have Linda drop the paperwork. And he tosses his phone over to uh, Mrs. Prince, and that's how he gets an interview with Prince Jr. Michael's sort of just cringing in the background the whole time. Yeah. Like, no, don't do this. <laughs> Very impressive. And I, I, I guess Dwight knows that they're about to get shut down or potentially shut down, so mm. his client may come back to him. Maybe so. It's weird. Very confident. We also see a scene with Dwight where he stole some outgoing mail from Prince Family Paper, and Michael says, isn't that a crime? But Dwight opens it and starts reading it, and Michael says, well, what does it say? And Dwight says, hey, it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently, Stanley also went to Prince Paper about a year ago for an interview. And was willing to take a pay cut. So we find that out. Kevin makes a masturbating joke that you can see coming a mile away. Yeah. Uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Daryl is polled in the hot or not debate. He votes hot. And he has a problem with this because Daryl works for the warehouse. So he's not, you know, an upstairs worker. So Andy says he should not have the right to vote. Oh. Of course, Daryl, you know, I'm sorry, what? And um, Pam, of course, reminds Andy that Daryl is the foreman, so he works upstairs and downstairs. So Andy suggests that Daryl perhaps get half of a vote. Oh, no. Daryl is just seething, and he says, how about three-fifths? <laughs> oh. And Andy doesn't catch it. He doesn't no. know. Mm -mm. Daryl is clearly very smart, very educated, and Andy, with his fancy Ivy League degree from some school, doesn't know about the three-fifths compromise. Daryl then says, I'm going to go use the whites only bathroom. <laughs> and he says, I don't think we have one of those. <laughs> not not good, Andy. It's just not he shouldn't be saying anything. <laughs> no, no. The gif that we have of Pam holding a hot sign doesn't come from the actual episode. It comes from the deleted scene where she, everybody's arguing and Pam just stands in the background with a big square of cardboard that says hot on it. And she's just holding it above her head, not saying anything. <laughs> I have just a couple smaller ones. Uh, Michael says he's not a shark. He's more of a dolphin. And Dwight says, you don't know dolphins very well then. He says in a talking head, we only hear about the people dolphins push back to shore. We don't hear about the ones they push out to sea. Dolphins just like pushing things. <laughs> and then at the ending... Uh, 
Michael has a talking head. He says, you know, I always thought about ruling with an iron fist and I'd be good at it. But with an iron fist, you can't caress the face of a child or make love to a woman with your hands or thumb wrestle or hang out in the rain or go through a magnet store. <laughs> and so he says, no more iron fisting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and we did not get a commentary on this episode. No. So our discussion topic today, I'm not sure I have an answer for this at all. I just was curious if you might have one. What's up with Stanley's uncharacteristically optimistic speech about how hot Hillary Swank is? He goes up and he's like, got this new lease on life and he's taking things slow and appreciating the hotness in life, basically. And where did that come from? I don't know. And, you know, I'm <laughs> curious if this comes technically after. No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I was thinking if this came after stress relief you know in the production schedule and it just got out yeah. of order because stuff happens in stress relief that would maybe lead mm -hmm. to this version of stanley who's more optimistic but no it's that's not the case looking at the production codes so i don't know i can only take him at his word really he says that he's trying to be more optimistic because his family history says he doesn't have a whole lot longer to live and so he's trying to live a a less a uh, pessimistic life, be a little bit happier. He says, look at this young woman. She's strong, attractive. She is hot. And I, I don't I don't know, beyond just saying, echoing his words, he, he is, I don't know, he's just trying to find a new lease on life. He's trying to be more optimistic with things. Yeah, that's what I took from it too. Um, I looked at the production codes as well, just because I was curious, because it seems like it could have been, a, you know, a, a slight, mix up mm -hmm. but um it wasn't and we just get optimistic stanley which i have no problem with <laughs> yeah and to be clear there are a few episodes in season five that are out of order from their production codes so that's right. not unheard of but prince paper does come before stress relief so that's not yeah. the answer here oh well <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that's the end of the official 45th episode of an american workplace we like those uh Every five, I don't know, round numbers. They're not round numbers, yeah. <laughs> but it just feels like an accomplishment. <laughs> Contact for the show, facebook.com slash workplace pod and at workplace pod on Twitter. Please go over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe. Email feedback and ideas to workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash katie.white. And the best place for me is at Chadadada on Twitter, also Facebook.com slash Chad.Hopkins, and my other podcast, Cinescope, where we talk about the movies we love and why we love them. Show notes and contact information for this show can be found at WorkplacePodcast.com. If you want a shout out and more of an American Workplace each week, including access to our discussion outlines and notes, a logo sticker, bonus episode, live stream, etc., check out our Patreon page and click the support level that you think is most worth it at patreon.com slash workplace pod. That's all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 45 of An American Workplace. Make sure to join us in episode 46 for our discussion of, on the next episode of season five, Stress Relief. Bye. <laughs>